this this morning uh, in, for Sabbath school, during Sabbath school time. And every time when I put my daughter down, 90% of the time when we ask her, what song would you like to sing before we go to sleep? She says, the power song, the power song. And so for the sake of my daughter, and for the sake of recognizing the power and beauty of the blood of Christ, let's sing Power in the Blood. Hymn number 294, 294, Power in the Blood. You cannot, yes, I agree with Deanne, the Spirit has spoke through her, so let us stand together and let's sing about the power. First line, ready to go. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in okay, the blood. Okay, just the men. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. Everyone together. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. Sing that chorus. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. You sound wonderful. You may be seated. This afternoon, we are so happy to have many of you who attended a different church this morning who could join us this afternoon. So happy for those of you who came for the entire weekend. And we want to just share with you a couple of things that are available to you. I know that Jerry and Janet have some resources that they will address a little later as well. My name is Deanne. I'm the prayer coordinator for Rocky Mountain Conference. And I just want you to know that it is just exciting to me to be your partner because anything that you need that has to do with prayer I know that you have great resources in your pastor and if there's anything that I can possibly do for you I'm here to do that for you there are some prayer opportunities for Rocky Mountain Conference and I have out on that little back table back there um, a paper that tells you all those different times that we have ways that you can join in in prayer with other believers. There's no power like the power of praying together. So every Wednesday morning, we have a prayer call, 6.30 to 7.30. It's a conference call. You can call in, you can just listen, or you can join in and pray. The first Thursday night of the month, we call it the first Thursday prayer call. And we have a prayer call the first Thursday from 7 to 8 p.m. Now we do that on the first Thursday because there's also a North American Division all night prayer call on the first 
first Thursday night of the month. And so those numbers you will see, uh, my business card out there has those numbers on it, and there's also a sheet. If you would like to call in a prayer request and just leave a voicemail prayer request, there's a number for that. If you'd like to text an email request, there's a number for that. Text a prayer request, there's a number for that. How do you like that? If you'd like to text an email request, if you'd like to text a prayer request, there's a number for that. So we just want you to know that we have more opportunities in addition to what I know many of our local churches are doing. Campion Church has a prayer line, and for that I'm so grateful. Every Wednesday morning you are welcome to come right here at 7 a.m. and pray. Our pastors and principals and whomever else would like to join in is welcome to come and pray. So we are also happy to let others know if you have a prayer call or if you have a prayer time, we are happy to share your information. There's each month, uh, approximately e each month, a Rocky Mountain Conference Prayer Ministries newsletter. It will typically have information on it a couple of times. Sometimes it has some suggestions for prayer. It has those prayer numbers, and it also has prayer requests that people from all around Rocky Mountain Conference send in. In addition to that, we would love for you to partner with us and be one of our prayer partners, one of the people that gets an email with prayer requests every once in a while. And so there's a paper on that back table that says, I'd like to be an RMC prayer partner. If you'd like to just put your name and your contact information, we would love to have that. Typically, I send things out by email, but I'm also happy to send something to you snail mail if you're not an email person. So we want you to know that we long to have more people praying, and we have seen God do some incredible things through our prayer groups. Um, and when people reach out, you know, sometimes people are like, well, tell me some big story. Well, I want you to know that every little story put together is, is God's story. And I'm so grateful for those of you who have um, partnered to, to pray with us. Many of you go to different churches, and I want to let you know just a little thing that's out there. Um, I, this idea was shared with me, and I love it. It's You can put a basket, or you can have your prayer coordinate coordinator for your church be in the foyer before church and hand out little cards that give people the opportunity to pray. So this one has several different ones. It's just a sentence. Please pray for our pastor to be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit today. Please pray for the children in our congregation. Please pray for the families in our congregation. Please pray for our physical building to be safe. There's a whole page full of different prayer prompts that you can encourage people in your church to pray. Another great idea with this is that you can have a time where everybody stops during church and prays over what you have. There are two other sheets, and they are just another version of the same general idea. They have a prayer written out, and they have some scriptures. But this is just another opportunity to give your, to give each of us an opportunity to pray during our church service for our pastor and beyond. There are several other resources out there, how to spend an hour in prayer, how to pray with your spouse, um, the ACTS model of prayer, um, many different things. And I want you to know that anything that's out there you are welcome to take with you and many of the resources that I will, would also share with you are resources that I got right off of Revival and Reformation, the General Conference Ministerial website that has many wonderful resources for you for prayer. So please, please take the time, anytime you need anything having to do with prayer, I am so happy to help you. Revival and Reformation, 10daysofprayer.org, wonderful, wonderful resources for you. So please join with us any opportunity that you have. There's never a bad time to pray, never. So grateful this afternoon to have Jerry and Janet with us again. Um, and I was going to have us pray over Jerry and Janet, but I only see one half of Jerry and Janet at the moment. So yeah, because she's praying with somebody else. Um, so we will do that in a moment. But what I'd like to ask you to do right now before, I, before we do our theme song is just to turn not to the person next to you because I see many people who live in the same house next to each other, which is a good thing, 
I'd like you to turn, if, if you can do this, to somebody that's in a pew in front of you or behind you. Let's gather in just groups of two or three, and let's do two things. First of all, let's pray for the Holy Spirit to just infuse. Uh, he's already here. Let's just thank him and praise him and invite him more into our lives as we learn more about prayer this afternoon. And then I'd like you to lift the other person up in prayer or the other couple people. So right now it's 2.45, and let's take three minutes to do that. Let's get together and let's pray over one another and for the Holy Spirit to join us in our afternoon gathering. We are going to take a moment. We, we are going to take a moment now to pray over Jerry and Janet. You know, they came here, and as I was praying with Jonas, we talked about how the disciples, we prayed about how the disciples, when they got back to Jerusalem, said, did not our hearts burn within us when they had been with Jesus? And I think we can all say our hearts have been burning within us. So we'd like Jerry and Janet, if you would, please just to come down here. And um, we'd like to pray over you because your job is, is precious. And, and so if you just want to be, now, do you mind if we touch you? No. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Because <laughs> you know some people don't want that. But if you're a touchy-feely and you want to come touch them, you can. And then, yeah, come on up because we need to surround them. Now, I saw another thing once that I just loved, and that was if you're like way in the back and you want to, you know, you really want to pray over them, but you're not going to come close, you can just do this. All right? So who's going to come around them? Oh, God, we're coming before you right now, gathering around our friends Jerry and Janet, who are clearly your friends. Thank you so much, God, for what they have and continue to pour into us. And Lord, you know the challenges that they face. They have a hectic travel schedule, and um, they've been both very vulnerable with us to let us know that just like us, the enemy is on the attack. And so we pray for them, Lord. We pray for them physically. We pray for them emotionally. We pray for them spiritually. We pray that you would continue to work as only you can do to fill them up with your spirit so that he just overflows to each one that they come in contact with. We bless them in the name of Jesus. And as they minister to us this afternoon, we are looking forward to what you're going to say through their lips and their actions. Thank you so much. We bless them in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Oh, testing one. Yeah. This song, I Surrender All, when I was a worship pastor over at the Adventure, um, I secretly met with our team and I said, when we sing this song, I Surrender All, I want you to say, I Surrender Some. So I said, we're just keeping it real. And so we started singing that. Of course, everybody's like, you know, we have to stop. And said, well, we just, we wanted to sing really what is many times in our hearts. We're afraid to surrender all, aren't we? We have fear. I remember a while ago, I was afraid to surrender all to Jesus because I thought he's going to make me go be a missionary in Africa. And so funny, like years, years later, I did actually take a trip to Africa and I came back and I was like, Okay, let's sell everything and let's go be missionaries in Africa. <laughs> so when you truly surrender all to Jesus, when you give him everything, life becomes sweeter than it was before. And I think the devil wants you to think it's not going to be. And he wants to put fear in your heart. But I don't know about you, but I want to surrender all to Jesus every day. Let's stand together. Let's sing 309. I surrender all. Just the first verse in chorus.
sing that chorus one more time. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. seated. God is so good. Whenever we meet with groups all over the world, by the time we spent two days with them or something, we just don't want to leave. <laughs> and no matter what culture, no matter what's, what differences in food or whatever, but uh, it's good to be home in Campion and to see people, so many that I've known and that we know. So thanks. Please, please do pray for us. Our bodies complain about jet lag all the time <laughs> and that kind of thing, and, but we're, we're happy with what we're doing and God has been good. Um, by the way, you had a great potluck. That was good. Now, you've got to stay awake. We're going to pray you'll stay awake. That, does prayer work? Okay. If you start dozing on me, I'm going to ask you to stand, and we'll stand for a few minutes and wiggle around. Uh, we'd like to ask you just to Stand for a second and just pray for the Holy Spirit again this afternoon. This, this time we're going to focus a lot on winning people with prayer, and uh, so we need, we need God's guidance. Thank you for helping us, speaking to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Did you all get the sheet? Statements on prayer and empowered ministries? Did you? Okay. This is one of our favorites. We drag it around the world, translate it and everything. It's just some of Ellen White's quotes <laughs> that are especially precious to us on, on the power of prayer, the need for prayer, and how it works with, with evangelism too. We'll be giving you a bunch of resources after this is after we talk today. And uh, Mark Finley's got a super magazine called Prayer Makes a Difference on prayer and evangelism and intercessory prayer and all. We've got one of those for all of you. We've got some books and other things, but we'll talk about that later. If you take your sheet for a minute, though, this um, sheet is sort of a summary of, um, as I said, some of our favorite statements. But the first statement is mine. It says, inspired writings and experience make it clear that two principles must be applied for all our ministries to be most fully used and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Number one, much personal and united prayer. Number two, much lay member involvement. Probably heard of TMI, too, along with, with the Revival and Reformation. So anyway, we, we'll only look at a few of these. The first one there says, uh, just quickly, what the Lord did for his people in that time, the early church, is just as essential and more so than he do for his people today. Then the next sentence, all that the apostles did, every church member is to do today. Wow. What did the disciples do? Silver and gold, I have none. <laughs> but rise and walk away. Oh, you're dead? Well, let me help you. Um, they spread the gospel in uh, 25 years to the whole world. and Amazing miracles all through it. Again, much prayer in every situation, obstacles or opportunities for the gospel. And the next thing, the Holy Spirit shows up. The next thing, the Word of God goes forth in power. And the next thing is the church grows. Um, the second statement you know well from, from uh, <clears throat> selected messages the revival of true godliness among us is the greatest need in Colorado. That hasn't changed. It's not any other need. To this, seek this should be our first work. Then our Heavenly Father is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him than earthly parents to give good gifts to their children. But it is our work by confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant His blessings. And then that last sentence, this revival, which is our greatest need, comes how? A revival need be expected only in answer to what? Okay, we're not talking about a side issue this weekend. Unless this happens, we won't see the Holy Spirit's power unleashed in fullness. And I love that next one. At the sound of fervent prayer, what happens? Wow. I need anything that makes Satan's host tremble. Amen? I'm so sick of him hurting my friends, my family, and trying to kill us all. Uh, so I like to do things that make him tremble because he knows God's power. It's not the prayer, it's God's power. Part of God's plan to grant us an answer to prayer of faith, that which he can't bestow if we don't ask, 
Number five is good for us administrators and pastors. It's the order of God that those who bear responsibilities should often meet together to counsel with one another, pray earnestly for that wisdom which He alone can impart. Unitedly make known your troubles to God. Talk less. <laughs> yeah. Much precious time is lost in talk that brings no light. Let brothers unite in fasting and prayer for the wisdom that God has promised to supply liberally. How many have sat on a board somewhere with lots of talk and no light? Yeah. Yap, yap, yap. Our own agendas. I've discovered, and we try to do it in our conferences where we were at, to pray for 15 or 20 minutes at the beginning of a meeting and save two hours at the end. Huh? Because when people know Jesus is in the room and they're talking to Him, it just changes the spirit. We're all a little more gentle, a little more un open to understanding. Number six, Ellen White said, this promise, Matthew 18, 19, and 20, about two or three gathering there, she says, is made on the condition the united prayers of the Church are offered. And in answer to these prayers, there may be expected a power what? Power what? Are you with me? A power greater than that, now I lost my place, uh, which comes in answer to private prayer. Why is that, she says. The power given will be proportionate to the unity of the members and their love for God and one another. The united prayer is when we get together in the upper room of one accord, and then the Holy Spirit gets excited, and He can do extra special things. Okay. Well, we won't read them all. Uh, number eight, we read about the Word. Number nine is really important for your own life. It's a long one. But she basically says, life is so busy, so much intensity, so many things suck us in that we don't be still and know that He's God. But notice on the back the uh, bolded ones here. Many, even in their seasons of devotion, fail of receiving the blessing of real communion with God. They're in too great haste. With hurried steps, they press through the circle of Christ's loving presence, pausing perhaps a moment within the sacred precincts, but not waiting for counsel. What does that mean? Well, they have no time to remain with the divine teacher. With their burdens, they return to their work. That's me so often. Pray for us. Busy, busy, busy around the world and time zones all around. These workers can never attain the highest success until they learn the secret of strength. They must give themselves time to think, to pray, to wait upon God for a renewal of physical, mental, and spiritual power. They need the uplifting influence of His Spirit. Receiving this, they will be quickened by fresh life. The wearied frame and tired brain will be refreshed and the burdened heart lightened. Not a pause for a moment in His presence, but personal contact with Jesus. To sit down in companionship with Him. This is my need. How about you? Yeah. Okay, next one for parents. We won't read it, but it's about Promises about putting your hand on the promise, praying for your kids. The mother of Augustine saw her son one after time. Um, again, number 11, four things that will draw us away from talking and thinking of Jesus. I'm going to take the time on number 13. We won't be talking much about sin here this weekend, but um, sin does hinder our fullness of the Spirit and our, and our usage for God. Uh, so we need to be confessing. Number 13 says, There's no influence in our land more powerful to poison the imagination to destroy religious impressions, and to blunt the relish for the tranquil pleasures and sober realities of life, then what? Let's see, is there a side door? I may need to run out of here now. Theatrical amusements, what's that? Moving pictures on internet or anywhere else. Huh? The love of these scenes increases with every indulgence as the desire for intoxicating drink strengthens with its use. The only safe course is to shun the theater and every other questionable movement. Oh, ouch, I better get out of here now. But seriously, we need to ask the Holy Spirit, is anything keeping us from prayer, from a closer walk with Jesus? Are we watching hours of what put Him on the cross every week and spending a couple of hours at church? Lord, help us to focus on the things that will make us the powerhouse You want us to be in this end time. Okay, I just want to tell you one quick story before I get to the main story this afternoon. Well, like Janet, I, I mean too. Young man loved to drive his car fast on uh, curvy mountain roads. He had a new sports car, and he enjoyed it very much. One bright Saturday afternoon, he was driving, came to a curve he couldn't see around, and a woman driver, sorry ladies, came around the curve out of control. And uh, she was almost flew off the cliff. At the last minute, she corrected and came back and was headed straight for him in his lane. He was panicking. It was going to be a head-on crash. But at the last minute, she corrected again and went around him. And as she flew by him, she yelled out of her window, PIG! at him. He was infuriated to think that this woman, who was in his lane, about to hit him, would insult him by calling him a pig. So he thought, what can I do? What can I do? 
So he hauled back at her, donkey! He felt quite proud of himself. He thought of something to insult her with and continued on around the curve and hit the big fat pig standing in the middle of the road. She wasn't insulting him. She was warning him, yeah, giving him an opportunity. Uh, in Chinese language, the word for crisis is danger and opportunity together, two picture characters. Every time there's a crisis, there's an opportunity. If we heed the warnings, God in his word, the spirit of prophecy, lots of warnings. I don't like them. It's like he's calling me pig sometimes, but everyone is for our good. And uh, we can take advantage and have opportunities if we will just warn, take his warnings as loving <laughs> warnings instead of an insult. Um, we were on 3ABN here a few weeks ago in November, and we did a program not about how to pray for evangelism, but the fact that around the world what we're seeing now is a phenomenon we've known for some time, but it's growing, and that is that prayer is evangelism. Prayer is evangelism. Bob, who accepted Jesus this week, one of the main things we did with him finally was pray for his kids, pray for him, pray for his cancer. They'll let you pray with them. Islam, you can pray with Islam women, women, as long as you don't talk Jesus, but they believe in Jesus, but I mean, you're just, you're just praying. Amazing what can happen. And uh, I just want to tell you the one quick story that's been an eight-year, nine-year miracle. Um, an elder at Kenya, an elder and his wife, got their pastor. Remember we called for praying at 7 and 7, 7, 7, 7, 7 morning, 7 evening, 7 day Adventist. And they took it seriously, as others have, and they started praying. I think it was an hour every Monday. And uh, then it began to grow. They began to invite other people. And it, then soon the 10 days of prayer came along, and they started inviting more people, doing the 10 days of prayer. And they were praying uh, several times a week, I think, and all kinds of things. I don't remember all the details. But by the time we got to the last GC session, this thing had grown dramatically. During the 100 days of prayer, they followed the call to prayer there, but they were inviting their friends, and lots of non-Adventists started coming. They had 100, then 200. They got so excited about just praying together with these Adventists that they began to invite their pastors. By last GC session, they had baptized 17 non-Adventist pastors, <laughs> brought their churches, some of them, with them because of praying together with these Adventists. Uh, they actually started a little school for these pastors. It went on after GC session. They have this little Bible school to train pastors of other churches, what we believe, kept on praying, praying, praying. They now have baptized about 120 non-Seventh-day Adventist pastors in one valley in Kenya. <laughs> Yeah, that's Africa, okay? We may not see that in Campion tomorrow, but we're seeing amazing things happen when people reach out. Women in refugee camps, call the other women together of all faiths, pray together, baptizing 70 or 80 people. You know. So prayer is prayer walking, praying for people at the door, praying for your neighbors. That is evangelism. And it's becoming to be, in some places, the only thing we can do because of oppression, anti-conversion laws, that kind of thing. So. Um, encourage you to think of that in your weaponry, that you're not just praying for people and for evangelism, but you're actually going to neighbors and praying more with them for their kids. And then when God works, they get excited about your God. They want to know more about what you believe. So that's a good thing. Well, I think I can trust you enough here. I'm going to tell you a story that you could think I'm bragging, and I'm not. If you listen carefully, Janet and I, it's a lifetime story from Central California. Some of you may have heard some of it. But it's a, it's a miracle that um, we cannot give credit for. And we just read the statement again last week that the last movements will be ones where the Holy Spirit takes the work out of our hands and does things that are so simple but so powerful and surprising, we will just be amazed trying to catch up. I believe that's happening and going to happen more. But when Janet had, uh, she never got to tell her testimony because I talked a little too long this morning, but she was, um, are you going to tell it to, this time? You may? You may? No, I won't. I'm just, the only reason I'm saying that is because, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, let me just go to this point. Okay. So we had found out that prayer made a big difference in the conference we were in before. But then we got called to go to Central California Conference from Pennsylvania. We were living in the country, beautiful Mennonite kind of country, uh, not far from Blue Mountain Academy. Our kids go to the school there, just like a Campion setting. We liked it. Then they called us to Central California Conference to be president there. And 
our first reactions were, no, we don't want to go out there. Some people say, oh, it's a bigger conference, it's beautiful out there, you'll like it, it's a good deal, it's a good call. But we saw it as Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Had San Francisco in it, Silicon Valley, San Jose, lots of liberal uh, people, lots of churches. San Francisco has one out of four active homosexuals in that city. So we thought, you know, we have a couple of young boys. <laughs> we're not sure we want to go out there. And so we, we fought it, we prayed about it, but we were always open to God's leading. Long story short, after about three weeks of prayer and fasting, God made it real clear to us we were supposed to go. And so we said, okay. He gave us promises he'd protect our boys and everything. Then Tyson, that she told you about last night, who was a sophomore in Academy, eight minutes from Blue Mountain Academy, asked us as we were getting ready to move, you know, I'd really like to stay here and move into the dorm next year. Broke our hearts, you know, <laughs> we're moving away from our son at a junior in Academy. Anyway, so that's a whole other story for another day. But uh, so we came out to Central Cal, and um, I'm telling you this because I don't know what church is like here or what your conference even. I know some things because I've been around here some, but I'll tell you a story about a change of culture. Sometimes our churches need a change of culture, uh, just a, a change of mindset, a change of believing what can happen and whatever. When we got to Central Cal. Um, we were quite shocked by what we found. There were good people there praying for new president, praying for things, and we found out there were many good people. And Central Cal is a very diverse conference. The Central Valley is very conservative, red politically, then you've got the Silicon Valley and, and the San Luis Obispo and Cal Poly and all that. So it's, it's really very diverse. But we did have a real anti-conference spirit amongst the pastors. Uh, they, the money had really dried up. And so um, they had uh, some money problems, you know, and California had just spent too much on some things. And Monterey Bay Academy was $2 million in debt. The previous treasurer had not had enough money to pay the bills, so he just put them in drawers and didn't tell anybody <laughs> about it. Piled up to about $2 million. And uh, people were talking about closing Monterey Bay Academy. The, uh, some of the pastors had come, had been readers or studied under Des Ford at PUC back in the day. Some of them really didn't believe in evangelism. They didn't really believe in some of our doctrines, to be honest with you. We couldn't prove it. They are very careful, but there was some real liberal, liberalness there. So some of the pastors in the larger churches are really saying, what do we need the conference for? What good do they do? Uh, the local churches were having a lot to do with who pastors were that were selected and moved different places. And so that was a problem. A lot of fighting. Uh, first conference committee I went to, there was a, a lawyer had about half the day talking about lawsuits and how it was going, this pastor that was suing and whatever. And I could go on. There was a feeling that evangelism didn't work anymore, especially in the Silicon Valley and the, you know, up there that you just don't do evangelism. So they kind of settled in to run their churches and you know, win a few as they could and that kind of thing. So anyway, we said, wow. Um, it's not Spanish to say, ay, 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 is it? <laughs> we thought, what problem have we gotten into here? We really didn't know what to do. One of the biggest things that they were upset about, the first meeting the lay advisory took me to, was at a restaurant, and they said, we are so angry at our conference. They have voted to sell the SoCal Camp Meeting Grounds, one of the large granddaddies in North America, if you know. Been going for years near the coast, and uh, not have camp meeting anymore. They were very angry. And uh, so we're coming in, <laughs> young guy, I don't know what to do. I don't know if camp meetings are anachronistic. I don't know if we should or shouldn't. So Janet and I were talking about it. She said, Jerry, we need to call for prayer. <laughs> and uh, I agreed. So we sent out a card to all the conference saying, you know, here we are to help lead, but we, get, we don't know how to deal with everything. So we need prayer partners. Would you be willing to be a prayer partner with us? We'll send you notes about what we need, what we're praying about. And hundreds of people sent in a card. So we started on a journey in Central California. And uh, we knew we needed a lot of prayer. And we had learned from our previous conference that prayer could make a real difference in churches and people's lives. So that's where we started. Janet got a group together praying um, at the conference office along the way. We had, um, I asked the conference committee if we could at least have one more camp meeting because we didn't know what SoCal was like. How could we know whether we should go or not go or sell the grounds? So anyway, they said, okay, one more time. So we spent most of the next year much prayer over every speaker that we chose, trying to get the most spiritual speakers we could get, 
over the children's division leaders, over theme song, over the grounds. And by the time the people got there, we were praying over everybody as they came on the grounds, when they got to their trailer space or the tent space. We were asking and pleading for God's presence to be there, for Him to show up and to show us what we should do about camp meeting. And uh, I'm, I can tell you, had a brief summary, God blew the roof off things that year because there was so much prayer and so much asking Him to do things. I believe if we did that with every meeting, evangelistic meeting, some other kind of meeting in the church, if we really take it seriously enough that we can't just do it ourselves and pray and pray and pray over it, things will happen. I know there's been much prayer over this prayer conference with your leaders. We thank you for, for having this here. Anyway, so we, we, we went through the camp meeting. I mean, the, we could tell you story after story of people coming on the grounds to help fix the trailers and going, there's just, just something we sense here. You know, God's presence is palpable. You can feel it. One guy wouldn't even take money for the fixing the trailer. He said, I don't know what it is here, but I'm not taking the money. They prayed over <clears throat> the people who cleaned the bathhouses. Some of them were not Adventists, and they were praying that some of them be converted. And, and that year, several were converted and became Christians. You know, it's amazing what happened. Young adults came back to camp meeting that wouldn't go to church. When the calls were made by these powerful speakers, they came down the aisles and gave their heart to Jesus. We started to be an evangelistic camp meeting. So we don't take credit for that. We're just saying that when we prayed, God kept guiding us to have this kind of a camp meeting, a spiritual camp meeting, evangelistic camp meeting. They used to have a lot of promotion at camp meeting for departments, you know, to get up and beat the drum for this one and that department and this department and education and everything, and take a, quite a bit of the worship time actually doing that. And so we decided we were going to have more like ASI or something, where we would have only, only time somebody could promote anything is a, a three-minute testimony of what God had done. Okay, if your ministry saw a miracle or an answer to prayer this year, you could have a testimony. So we had worship ahead of the speakers, and that kind of thing made a difference. Okay, so that was the first year. Then we, we'd be praying all over these other things, and we began to see things happening, answers to prayer uh, in different places. And uh, the prayer partners and us, we were seeing answers to prayer. We were excited about that. But the prayer partners, after a while, began to say, you know, our real goal is to see everybody in this conference become a prayer <laughs> more than they have been. And when there's a problem in their school or in their marriage, they don't come to the conference and say, pray for us or give us money. They go to God themselves and pray and watch what God can do there. And they said, you know, that's the real goal, and right now it doesn't seem to be getting through. So anyway, they went to God and did what I believe we should do. And the little illustration I told you is, is my example of what leadership in the church should be. Instead of us saying, well, this is a program that worked over here. Let's plop it on this here, humanly, and make it work. We go to God and we say, God, what do you want to do? What will you do? What is your vision? What is your big idea, as your pastor said? And so they did that, and they waited. They didn't even tell me or the evangelism committee. And uh, so anyway, finally, after several weeks, God impressed them that he was wanting to do something with the evangelism offering that was taken up at camp meeting every year. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that was an interesting thing. But they really felt impressed. He wanted, it, it had been 80000 maybe $100,000 a year for many, many years, never different. They would auction things off, they would promote, and they'd get eighty dollars to $100,000. But they prayed, and they believed God wanted to do something with that, and they prayed, okay, we're going to pray with you, God. there will be an overflow this year with no extra promotion or anything. So that first year then, the second year of camp meeting, there was a, it went to about 130000 140000 And I said, praise the Lord. And they came to me as president. They said, Jerry, God is going to do something amazing with this evangelism offering. You need to really raise the goal high and have faith. Have faith. You see how I have gray hair now? You see that? Prayer partners will push you. People get praying. They believe God can do anything. And they begin to push administrators and leaders. So anyway, uh, we took it to the evangelism committee. They heard it, but they didn't raise the goal much at all for the next year. So they said, okay, we're going to pray. We'll, we'll see what God's going to do. And they really prayed. And you know, the next year it almost doubled to $240,000. And uh, that caught my attention. <laughs> and we began to really pray. We began to ask the people, you know, I told them, I said, you folks, we believe, the prayer partners believe that God is, is wanting to do something to show us what united prayer will do. If we'll pray together, what He can do. And we think He's going to do it through this offering. 
But I said, I don't like to raise money. I'm a preacher. I'm not a money raiser. I'm not a development person. So we're not going to twist your arms. We're just going to ask you to join us in praying during the 10 days. And then if God impresses you to pledge anything for the next year, fine. And if he doesn't, don't, you know. So we started on that journey. We gave him some time in the camp meeting to actually listen to God for five or 10 minutes there, see if he spoke to them, and then give them an example so they could do that during camp meeting. And you know, uh, things began to go up every year from then on. The next year it was 300 and some thousand dollars. That began to spur our other visions God wanted. He's so smart when he does something. Began to expand our evangelism. We, we doubled our literature, student literature evangelism program. We started having young Bible workers come out into our churches and train. We started the Souls West um, Training Institute out there eventually. The glow tracks came down the road at two. It went to 300, 400,000. So I don't want to go on and on and make, draw this out too much, but I do want to tell you some of the key things that God did in this process. And we got not only our prayer partners, but many people in the, in the conference were excited. As they saw this going up each year, they said, this is a God thing. <laughs> when, when our people see that something's a God thing, they want on. You know, They don't want to miss the train if Jesus is leading or the Holy Spirit's involved. If they think it's just the leaders trying to get more money to do something and maybe brag about it, uh, you know, not too excited, are you? <laughs> and so anyway, we just kept saying, this is not about us, folks. We're just praying. See what God's going to do. If he stops, we'll stop. But we were hiring new people just for one year at a time. And that's hard on a president, too. You know, you like to control. You like to know what's going to happen. But instead, I had to be on my face praying every year <laughs> that things would keep moving the right direction. And God really did bless. But, you know, another part of the journey that we didn't know right at the beginning was the stewardship journey. Huh? You know, Ellen White says in one place that the greatest sin of Laodicea, what, what do you think she says? I, I thought it would be, you know, Baal Peor, immorality, something like that. Ellen White says the greatest sin of Laodicea is materialism. Yeah. So God was breaking the central Cal materialism thing at the same time. And as people would go to God and ask what to give, it's amazing. He would ask them to give more than they could give. Uh, I think of Sylvia. She was a young Spanish single mother. She and her daughter, she worked in the office, a little secretarial job. She could barely pay her bills. And um, she went and asked God what to give. He told her to pledge $5,000 for the next year. When Sylvia came and told us, we went, oh, wow, we'll be praying for you, Sylvia. We're thinking, God, are you going to come through for her? But you know, by March of the next year, God had paid off her pledge and helped her buy a house as well. Helped her get started buying a house. Sylvia came to camp meeting just glowing. I mean, she couldn't wait to tell her story. Got her up front in church and said, tell us what Jesus did for you. Well, he, he made me pledge. I couldn't see how I could do it. He paid that off, and then he's helped me start buying a house this year, too. I'm telling you, we had thousands of people came to camp meeting, and when they began to see that God was touching hearts like Sylvia, bringing her joy and power. Lee Birdie was a retiree, uh, an educational superintendent associate, and um, she and her husband were coming. And You know, they were retired. They didn't have a lot of money, but they kept asking God what to do, and he would ask them to pledge more than they could see. And the next year, they'd come back excited. But then Lee's husband died, Jim. And so she said, Jen and I said, you know, <laughs> Jim died last year. Now my income's really restricted. I won't be able to give as much this year. We said, Lee, that's fine. We're not after your money. We're just watching what God's doing here and going along with him. And so, but she went and she talked to God. God told her to double what she and Jim had been giving the year before. Do you know that year, God gave Lee a little job just long enough to pay off that pledge, and then it stopped. So when she came to camp, me, Jesus is alive. You know, he, he did this. It's like the old investment program they used to have. Now, this is going to get really good now, so I'm going to ask you to stand for just a minute and stretch, because I saw three of you starting to sleep. and It makes me feel bad, and I, you know, I just need to... Okay, stretch. Hit your wife, your husband. Smack him a little bit. Yeah, there you go. Good meal, sitting listening to some boring guy. Wow, it's really hard to stay awake. Oh, boy, they've got both hands up in the back there. That's the pastor's wife, I think. Yes, she's ready to go. Okay, when you're done, you can sit down. So we have the evangelism exploding now. These young people, 100 or so, Student literature evangelists covering our conference with great controversy and these other books every summer. 
the program is expanding and training Bible workers, and they're helping our, they're so excited they don't know what they can't do, and they're taking the layman out <laughs> and, and helping them get Bible studies and stuff. It was amazing. We had, of course, more evangelistic meetings, but we had health projects. Now when the church has asked for a little bit of money, instead of saying, no, there's no money, which the treasurer always did, we could say, well, we have a committee and we have some money. We got an extra 100000 last year. So they could make projects, they could try some creative things, and the spirit in the conference began to change because everybody saw God working. Some of these cynical pastors began to say, well, maybe I better get on board. A few of them said, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> I don't like this kind of spiritual stuff. But, you know, Anyway, on we went. It went to a half million dollars. Never happened before in North America that we know of. And then people began to call me. Hey, Jerry, my president friends, how are you raising all that money for evangelism? We need money for evangelism over here. And I'd say, well, you know, and I'd start telling them the prayer journey. Well, the prayer partners asked God what he was going to do. He said, the prayer, you know, and so we're praying. The people are all praying. They go and ask God what to give, and he tells them more than they can see. They said, yeah, we'll pray, but what are you doing? And what are your methods, <laughs> Come on, what, the letters you write, what do you... You see, we, we administrators, we like to be able to just do things and know it's going to work. But when you're over your head and you can't get $500,000 or more a year for evangelism money from your people, you got to pray. That's hard work. It is hard work. And we were praying. And I have gray hair because I couldn't control things. But God did amazing things for us. And I'll make this short. Over the next few years, as people kept asking God what to do, and Janet, can you going to tell our story? Because <laughs> I won't tell that. Tell whatever I want. Anyway, when I get, get a wife like Janet, who's asking God what we should give, I won't even tell you how bad it was for us. I mean, we didn't own a house. You heard our story. We're sad. We're going to take up an offering after this meeting for because we're near retirement, don't have a house. But God kept telling us to double it every year. And we had two kids. We had school, you know, college. And, we couldn't do that. But God kept surprising us and meeting our pledge too. And so Janet would get up front and just tell them what God was doing for us. <laughs> People say, hey, our leaders are in too. This is okay. It's not just us. And so everybody knew it was a God thing. Thousands were praying, and we were all rejoicing in what God did. Then the prayer partners, we got up to about 700,000 or something. And uh, that's how Glow Tracks got started. We said to our LA team, said, hey, we got all this money. You guys got any new ideas what we can do? They came back and said, every member ought to be a literature evangelist, not just the ones that are getting paid for it. We want to start a little track, call it Glow Tracks. You know, they got about a hundred million of those things out in how many languages now? I don't know. God is wonderful. Evangelism, stewardship, <laughs> unity in the conference, changing the culture. This was God's vision when he told them, pray about that evangelism offering. He knows that money catches administrators' attention. Around the world, they began to call, what are you doing over there? Get all this money. Then the prayer partners felt that God was telling them to pray for a million-dollar offering. And uh, I got to admit, some of us thought they were getting a little bit presumptuous, you know, <laughs> oh, we got 500,000, now we get minimum. But it kept going up, seven, 800,000, and finally, one year, it went to a million dollars. Yeah, a million dollars in 10 days. I can remember we had a box down front for the last night, and I remember the little kids coming down the aisle with a $20 bill or something to put in. They wanted to get the last of the million, and sure enough, we hit a million, and when we did, People were just pointing to heaven and praising God for what He had done. And they felt a part of it because it was all about united prayer, not about wonderful development plans or a great president or whatever. So anyway, after we had the million and we were figuring out all the new ways to do evangelism and giving money away to the schools, even gave chaplain money for schools, and money overseas some, um, <clears throat> I was a little afraid that maybe the people would get tired of it, <laughs> maybe God had changed His mind. And then I'd have to start laying people off all the time, right? So I was a little nervous. I think the next year it hit a million again. Then the next year, we were walking the grounds as we did ahead of camp meeting, a week ahead of camp meeting. We'd walk the grounds, pray over every tent, pray over the children's divisions, pray over everything, then pray during the camp meeting, meeting several days, um, all during the day praying. That year as we were praying over the young adult tent up in the foothills, Janet was with us, the treasurer was there. And as we're praying, Janet starts praying. She says, Lord, we thank you for what you've done with this evangelism offering. It's been a wonderful miracle, showing of a united prayer what can happen. She said, you know, some of us prayer partners, um, we're just praying to keep going, but she said, you know, some of us prayer partners really believe that you're asking us to pray for a $2 million offering this year. And I think, I think the treasure sucked air, I'm not sure. <laughs> but we thought, well, $2 million? Come on, that's impossible. And 
I thought maybe they have gone a little crazy now. But we come to trust Janet and the others. We prayed with them. During the week, we were praying, watching. They kept praying for $2 million. At the end of the week, Saturday night, they were putting a mic on my ear outside the auditorium. A man walked up to me. He was a developer. He had a little money, we knew, he and his brother, but he hadn't been giving to the offering. And he said, well, Jerry, how's the offering going this year? And I said, well, it's going well again. It's 900000 I think we're going to hit a million before we're done. We're praising God. But I said, I think maybe our prayer partners have gone a little crazy. A couple of them think God's told them to pray for a $2 million offering. <laughs> and we were kind of laughed. And his eyes got big. He said, are you kidding me? Somebody's feeling God told them to pray for a 2 million. I can't believe that, he said. He said, my brother and I, we sat down after lunch today to talk. And we said, well, let's do what Jerry and Janet asked. Let's, let's ask God what we should do. And he said, we, we asked God. And we were thinking, maybe we give them $100,000, send them over the goal, make them happy. But he said, as we sat there talking, and we have no idea how we'll do this, we don't have this kind of money, God impressed us that we should put a million dollars on the top of what everybody else gives this year. I think the guy that was putting my mic on dropped it on the ground. He was shaking. He was scared. He said, I don't know how we do this. We don't have it. But he said, if you're praying for that, and we felt impressed, we're going to do it. Janet went with him to pray, and he was shaking. But he got out his pledge card, and he wrote out a million dollars for the pledge. You know, when I got up that night with these thousands of people at SoCal that had prayed with us and had come to, we loved them, they loved us, it was just a love fest, I'm telling you, a love of Jesus, praising him and just praising him, $2 million offering, what we could do with that money the next year. We were having to have prayer and fasting retreats with our our evangelism committee every year and our departmental people to decide how to use the extra $100,000. What a wonderful way to spend a weekend. Anyway, so a $2 million evangelism offering caught the world's attention for sure. But what about that guy? Six months later, this guy called Janet on her cell phone. And the prayer partners he'd asked to pray several years before, he'd build a hospital, they were builders, he'd build a hospital for the U.S. government but the U.S. government um, had backed out of the contract and didn't pay. So they'd taken the government to court, tried to get the money, but had lost every appeal. Finally, they told the prayer partners, take it off the list. Last appeal failed. But Janet and some of them felt impressed to keep praying persistently over this, this thing. Well, anyway, he called on the phone six months after he made that million-dollar pledge. And he said, Janet, Janet, tell the prayer partners thank you. Thank you for praying. He said, you won't believe what happened today. He said, the U.S. government, it's never happened before. They'll put it in the law books, I think. He said, a federal judge found the U.S. government in bad faith and ordered them to pay me $17 million. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can't outgive God. And what is the greatest need in Campion, in Colorado, in, in the General Conference, in, in Burundi, in, in Africa, in, in India? When we go around the world, we say, what is your greatest need? Is it money? <laughs> Most of them cannot say no. <laughs> they just don't have money lots of places. They're going, yeah. Is it really your need money? Is our need money? No. Our God makes money <laughs> like that. Our God, Ellen White says, prayer is the key in the hand of faith that unlocks heaven's storehouse, wherein are stored the boundless resources of omnipotence. Our problem is not money, folks. Our problem is not even people. Gideon had too many people, right? Our problem is what? Praying and trusting that our God, if we're praying and asking for His plans, will blow the roof off. He will do amazing things. But one of the things we need to learn is to pray asking God, lead us how to pray. You know, Romans 8, 26, what does it say? Um, the Holy Spirit helps us, right? Because we don't know how to pray, He intercedes for us. However, there's an asterisk by that for, and some versions say in us. Ellen White says in Christ Optic Lessons 147, what it means is that we should be asking the Holy Spirit to indict the prayers out of us that we need to pray for God's great controversy. If we will not just go and tell God what we want, if we will not just look at what somebody else is doing and ask God to bless our plans after we make them, if we would really wait on God for counsel, wait until He tells us what He wants, look out. 
Look out. God will do amazing things, amazing things. One last story, then Janet's going to come. Um, one of my favorite stories of SoCal camp meetings, not even the $2 million miracle, but it's um, a mother and her two kids. After camp meeting one year, they were out of money. They didn't have any money coming for at least a couple weeks or more. Uh, they were very poor. And they had some food. They needed to get across the desert, and they wouldn't have a check. So they needed ice, but the ice was gone. No money to buy ice. So they, uh, they got down by their cots, and they prayed. The little kids prayed, Jesus, we need some ice or some money, something. Help us, please. We've got to save this food till our checks come. They got up from their knees. I don't know how long it was afterwards. But under the flap of their tent rolled a big block of ice. You're looking at me like you don't believe me now. So. Yeah. Our God can do anything. We found out where the block of ice came from. There was a, we, we have terraces for tents at camp meeting. It goes up like this up a hill. Two or so terraces above was a doctor and his wife preparing to go home Sunday. And they were emptying out the ice chest, the wife. And the block of ice got away from her. Rolled over the terrace, down another terrace, another terrace, and into the tent. She thought, oh, you idiot, you rolled your ice into some poor person's tent. Do you think those two kids are going to forget that prayer? When they asked Jesus for ice, and he rolled it into their tent. Hallelujah. Our God can do anything. If his people will call on his name, We'll wait for counsel from him. What does he want to do instead of telling him what we want to do all the time? If we're on his track, nothing can stop us. Nothing. I believe God's going to bless your upcoming evangelistic thrust. But it will be blessed based on how much you pray. I really believe that. And how much you cooperate together. How much unity there is. Are you going to fight or are you going to pray together and ask God to give you miracles and send you laborers and give you new people? He will do amazing things. If we unite like the upper room and we pray like the upper room, we'll see the book of Acts happen again. God bless you. Oh, I just got to tell you the end. I told you about the problems. <laughs> Quickly, the uh, Monterey Bay debt was paid off in about four years. God gave us the right treasure. He had the, it wasn't called Ramsey then, but the Ramsey theory. Take the smallest debt, roll it over, save the interest, roll it over, roll it over. Two, four, four to five years we had the $2 million paid off. Other miracles came there. Uh, we just saw the change of culture in the conference. The pastors saw the miracles. They knew evangelism could happen. Our baptisms were the highest they'd ever been in history when we left. And we don't brag. And the people weren't saying, "Why oh, that Jerry Page, you know, he's great. They were saying, if we'd pray in our church, in our marriages, in our homes, we would see the same kind of miracles. Praise God. It sounds like Jerry and I need to communicate more, doesn't it? <laughs> are you going to share this? No, are you going to share that? Anyway, we don't know until we get up here what we're going to do. I just need to pray. Would you stand with me? <clears throat> Oh, Father, how good it is to have a God like you that, that comes near when we pray. We're, we're told that in, I think it's Deuteronomy. Lord, just please bless. You know, there's so much I'd love to share, but there's a short amount of time and ability to listen. Please, God, I pray for your words as you promised in Isaiah 51, that you'll put your words in our mouth. I need that. And bless each one here. Even, as we've said before, even if it's not what we say, we just give you permission to speak to each one. And Lord, don't let anyone leave here without knowing you have ministered to their heart. It may be in ways they don't even know they need. Just do your mighty work, Lord, in each of our hearts, in Jerry and in mine. We thank you, we praise you, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Um, some of you I know probably know my testimony. I'll just do it really brief so I can share something else. But uh, I, I was a very depressed pastor's wife. I didn't like the ministry. Uh, it was at the worst time when Jerry was asked to be the conference president. I was home actually praying he wouldn't get voted in. 
Um, and Jerry came home with a dozen yellow roses, letting me know he'd been voted in, which was wonderful. But I, I grew up in the home of an administrator, and I know how stressful the problems that there can be, so I didn't want that. Fortunately, Jerry has been good. He does not bring his problems home. Um, I mean, he might bring them home to pray about, but they don't affect his, you know, in other words, he's not grouchy about them. <laughs> Where sometimes administrators can come home and take it out on their family. Jerry has not done that. So I'm thankful. But I, I was um, extremely depressed, miserable, and church members did not know this, but he was voted in right at the time of camp meeting. So people were coming up to me saying, congratulations, how does it feel to be the first lady? And I just hate that kind of talk. And I would say to them, I wash his clothes the same way I always have. Nothing's changed. And, but fortunately, the last Sabbath of the 10-day camp meeting, people started saying something different. They started saying, we've attended a seminar this week on the Holy Spirit. And the speaker's been teaching us how important it is that we pray every day for the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our lives, continually through the day, in our children's lives, but in our leaders' lives. And the speaker got them to commit to pray for Jerry and I every day for the Holy Spirit in our lives. And they didn't know that I was depressed, that I didn't want to live anymore. They didn't know I didn't think God could save me. I was too sinful. I, I'd just given up on God, on life. And um, they didn't know that, but these people took it on to pray. And that last Sabbath, they were coming up to me saying, we have committed to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit for you and Jerry every day. And I didn't think much about it. I told them, thank you, but, you know, what good does prayer do? I hadn't seen it do any, you know, big things. And for two years, we'd be in a different church almost every Sabbath, and someone somewhere would come up to me and say, we're praying for you and Jerry. When we meet in our Bible study groups, we pray for you and Jerry for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Two years of those people praying, my life was literally turned upside down totally changed and and I, I don't feel like I need to share the rest of that story but it's amazing how God pulled me into spending time with him again letting God heal me of bitterness in my life the bitterness is what had taken me away from God and I didn't know it God was trying to get me to heal things in a relationship with someone and I refused I said that's too hard I'm not doing it they're the problem I'm not when God finally got me to deal with that, it just totally changed my experience with God. So I don't know if there's a sin in your life. It may not be bitterness, it may be something else. And you think you can just forget about it and go on having an experience with God. It doesn't work. It will affect your spiritual life. It makes things dry up. And you know, I got to the point, I didn't think my prayers went higher than the ceiling. And, and, and Jerry and I, were, we started having marriage problems. Jerry didn't know it, but, but I knew it. And, and just, you know, it's just everything was bad for me. But God, God will keep pursuing you. He loves you so much. I don't know where you're at in your life with God, but he will not give up on you. He will, you wouldn't be sitting here if God wasn't working on you. Somehow, some way. You may be doing great with the Lord, but some of you may be struggling. You're not here. You're only here because God got you here. He will pu push and pursue you and pursue you till you give up. <laughs> and there's no better way than giving up to God. Oh, it's incredible, the life that God will give you. And anyway, um, I don't know. I guess I'm supposed to talk about evangelism. I wanna, which would be more important? Talk about evangelism, how we've reached our neighbors, or talk about my kids? Kids? Okay. I just want you to know, the more you pray, you'll see neighbors. God do miracles in their lives. Miracles. But my kids, okay, my son, Zach, he's just like his father there. I think that was what the problem was. I don't know. But Zach, Zach, um, I get a phone call one day. Now, now Zach and I were, have always been really close because his brother was seven and a half years older. He'd been off at school. Jerry's traveling all the time as a conference president. So it's just Zach and me. 
And I did everything with this boy. You know, we'd bring him to Colorado here and I would hike the 14,000 foot peaks. I've done like 27 of them. Some of those are repeats. Um, but just because Zach wanted to do all this. And of course, he's at the top waiting on me while I'm trying to get up there. And people are coming down going, way to go. We know you're his mom. Yeah, you keep it up. Mm, thanks. But he almost developed hypothermia at the top waiting on me. But anyway, I taught him how to drive a car. I, I took him mountain biking. Of course, he was always at the top and down at the bottom before I got there. I took him skiing. I, I taught him how to rotate his tires, change the oil on his car. I did everything with this boy. And I would have family worship with him morning and evening. And Zach loved to pray with me. But then Zach became a teenager. And, and um, I made a big mistake. I pushed him to get his driver's license as soon as he could. Don't do that. Put it off. Make them wait till they're 35. Just don't let them get a hold of that car, especially if it's a boy. But I get a phone call. We lived 45 minutes away from the school where he commuted to. And I get a phone call one day. Zach has been suspended from school. And they told me what he'd done. And I hung up the phone. I'm waiting, you know, Zach's driving home. I'm going, God, how could my son do this? How could my son do this? We've raised him better than this. We've taught him better than this. How could my son do this? And as I'm saying this out loud, I suddenly get this thought in my mind, why don't you ask me what it is about you that would cause your son to do this? And I thought, I've never done what he did. It's not my fault. You know, I, I've never done anything like that. It's, it's not my fault. And just again, why don't you ask me? So I, I knelt down by the couch and very, I have to say, very arrogantly, I prayed, okay, what is it about me that would make him do this? Because I knew there was nothing I had done. But do you know, as soon as I prayed that, it shot through my little brain exactly what I had done, what I had role modeled to this young boy that made him think it was okay to do what he did. It's a different thing, but, and I was, my heart just broke. And, you know, I asked God to forgive me. I knew God had forgiven me. And when my son came home, he's wondering, you know, what is his mother gonna do? What is she gonna say? And he was ready for a big lecture. But he came in the door and I said, Zach, come sit down. I need to talk to you. And I said, Zach, I've been asking God, you know, why you do what you did. And God told me it's my fault, Zach. And I said, uh, I feel really bad about that. I've asked God to forgive me, but I need you to forgive me, Zach, for being such a bad role model to you. Will you forgive me? You should have seen this big, tough, now he's five, six, right? Five, six, six, five. He's what? Six, six, thank you. Anyway, he's six, six. So, you know, he's big guy. Well, he's vegan now, so he's not quite as big, but it's, it makes you go smaller. But anyway, but he's still high, tall. But anyway, I said to Zach, you know, what I just said, you should have seen this tough, hard, rebellious kid. Tears are in his eyes. He's trying not to cry. I don't know where you're at with your kids, what goes on, or where you're at with your mate, but if you start having conflict and problems, you know, the first thing we need to do is go to God and say, God, what is it about me? What is it about me? There may be nothing about you that's causing it, but a lot of times there may be. Somehow we need to change. Well, you know, Zach, I could tell, was getting into things and stuff that were not good, and, and I won't go into all of that, but I was praying, God, what do I do? What do I do? And I just felt like God said, don't do anything but pray. Just keep praying and claiming the promises. And so uh, and Jerry's praying too, we, we were doing this. And Zach got into sports and he had to leave at 5.30 in the morning to get there at 6.30 to practice. And he would rush out the door. I wanted to pray with him before he left, but it's like he didn't want me to pray with him anymore. Zach always loved to pray with me. But he was, no, I don't have time, mom, and he's out the door. And I thought, you know, God, what's wrong? Why doesn't my son want me to pray with him anymore? I asked that in the morning in my worship. That evening, I think it was, 
I, I waited up for this boy. He's late coming home from sports practice, and, and I had dinner waiting on him, and I'm sitting there while he's eating it, watching him, and Zach's eating, and he finally puts his fork down, and he says, Mom, I really don't like your lecture manipulative prayers. Well, I had learned the hard way that when my sons say something to me that hurts to keep my mouth shut, don't say anything, that I need to pray about it. Because if I respond right away, then I gotta apologize for what I responded with. You know, I'm hot, quick tempered. I haven't been quite so good at that with Jerry. I'm still working on it. But with my boys, I've learned. So the next morning in my worship, I'm asking God, God, what is it? Why, why would my son say lecture manipulative prayers? I'm just trying to love him. I'm just praying for him. And what came into my mind was think about how you pray for him. And so I started thinking, well, how do I pray for him? Dear Lord, help Zach not to speed as he drives to school. He's already had two speeding tickets. One more speeding ticket and he will lose his driver's license. Dear Lord, help Zach not to drive too close to the car in front of him. He's already hit a car. He hits one more. We won't be able to afford car insurance for him. Dear Lord, help Zach to study and not fool around so he'll get scholarships and can get into college. God was letting me know those were lecture manipulative prayers. Well, I was hurt. I said, well, I'm just trying to love him and help him. How am I supposed to pray for him? And God didn't answer me right away. And I started, you know, reading my Bible. And I don't think it was actually till the next day. But as I was reading the Bible, what I became impressed with is that I needed to pray prayers of blessing on Zach. But I thought, you know, how do you do that? And is this really God? Is this not? I don't know how you are, but I a lot of times doubt. You know, is God speaking to me? Is he is? Is he not? And, you know, we have to be careful, too with what we think God's saying to us. If it goes against God's word, it's not from God. God will never go against his, the Bible. And sometimes things are in the gray area. For me, I go to Jerry. Jerry's my spiritual leader. And I go to him, bounce it off of him. You know, do you think I should do this or whatever? You know, we need to have those spiritual mentors in our life. Someone who won't just give us their counsel, but will pray with us about how we feel God's leading us. But we need to be careful, because uh, Satan can disguise himself and make us think it's God talking. If you come up with some idea that you think God has given you, that the church leaders in the Bible, everything, say differently, don't think you're an island, a one person that's, that's a prophet. The, the devil will trick you, and so you, you must be careful with it. But anyway, I was feeling like God was telling me, to pray prayers of blessing on him, and, and even to pray prayers of blessing on God. And I thought, who am I to bless God? I mean, he's God. I'm a sinner. And, and so I'm doubting, is this God, is it not? Well, that Sabbath, we were in a church up in San Francisco, and I'm coming out of a Sabbath school class. Some woman coming down the stairs stops me. She says, Janet, Janet, wait. I have a gift for you. And I didn't know this woman. And so I thought, a gift? Oh, wow. She, and then she says, God told me to give you this. And I'm thinking, ha, finally, my million dollars has come in. And I, so I, it was just a tiny little gift bag. So I grabbed it and I said, oh, thank you. And I opened it up. All it was in there was a little book, small little book. But the title on the book was The Power of the Spoken Blessing. And it was all about just stories, testimonies of what happens the healing that can happen, just the miracles that can happen as we pray prayers of blessing on our children, on our mates, and even on someone who's hurt us, and even to pray prayers of blessing on God. And so I decided, yes, God's telling me to do this. He got this woman to give me this book. So I started trying to do this. I started praying, asking God for scriptures that I could pray blessings with on my son. And so the, the 
the next time I got a chance, you know, Zach's going to rush to get out the door. So I get there early and I'm blocking the door so he can't get out. And he comes, mom, mom, I got to go. I'm late. I said, no, just let me play, pray real quick with you, Zach. And so I prayed really quick, just a prayer blessing, no, no lecture in the prayer. And just ask God to bless him um, with good friendships, bless him financially, because he'd started up his own little business and, and just anything I could. I was praying these prayers of blessing on him. And I kept trying to do this every morning. I'll never forget, a couple of weeks had gone by, but I was late getting to the door one morning. I was trying to get my robe on and get out there, and Zach's yelling, Mom, Mom, where are you, Mom? Mom, are you going to come pray for me? Several times that happened when I was late getting to the door. Such a change. This boy now wanted me to pray for him. Oh, that we listen to God, that we wait on God and talk to God and let God show us through his word what we should do, how we should be, how we should pray. But you know, with Zach, somewhere during this time, I started telling God, you know, I love my son, but I really don't like him anymore because he just acts mean towards me. We used to be good friends. We were buddies. But now he treats me not so nice. It's, it's, it, I just don't like him anymore, God. And just so quick came into my mind, I want you to start praising and thanking me for like five things about Zach every day. I thought, what? There's nothing good about him right now. But I decided God's telling me to do this. I had to do it. And because and, it always turns out to be a blessing if I do what God wants. So I started thinking, what can I thank you for about Zach? Because, you know, I'm thinking it needs to be something positive, not negative. What can I thank you for about Zach? And I said, well, and I was writing in my prayer journal, I thank you that Zach is not an axe murderer yet. <laughs> and anyway, and I came up with a few more things. And every day I started writing these. And I would try to come up with a few new things, which was hard. And so sometimes I would repeat. But you know, after several weeks went by, my son started changing. He started being sweet and loving towards me. And I thought, what's gotten into him? Why has he changed? And I started asking God that, you know, in my worship time. And God started showing me, it, it's not your son that's changed, it's you that's changed. And that has caused him to change. You see, you probably already know this, but your children, I don't care what age they are, it's inborn in them as the birds fly north and south that they crave your approval. They, they may say, I don't care what you think, but deep inside of them, they crave your approval. It's just part of them. And we must, our kids desperately need us to give them approval somehow, some way. They, they need this. And I had a woman say to me once when I was telling this about her daughter, she said, I can't act happy or approve of my daughter. What she's doing is wrong. Her daughter was living with some guy, and I don't know what else all she was doing. And so the mother said, I can't be happy around her. I can't approve of her. She'll think it's okay to do all she's doing. I said, no, no. Look, the Holy Spirit is perfectly capable of making your child miserable. The child does not need you to make them miserable. What, listen, if we want them to want our God, if we want them to want our religion, they need to see us as happy, joyful Christians, loving Christians. Why would our children want our religion, our God, if we're miserable around them? if we're criticizing them and, and, and acting sad around them because they're not living right or telling them, you know, get your life together, get a job. They don't need that. What they need is for us to pray and to show them love, the love of God. And that's what God started showing me. You need, if you want Zach to want your religion, be happy around him. Show him joy. You know, why are they going to want your religion if you're miserable and depressed all the time? So... I knew that's what had happened because as I focused on five things every day to thank God for about him, I started changing how I felt about him. 
And even though I didn't say anything, you see, somebody you're close with, your, your child, they can sense whether you approve of them or not. And Zach could sense that I was changing towards him. And because of that, Zach started being kinder and more loving. Does that make sense? Not confusing? And I just love God. God is so personal. And I'm so thankful he didn't give up on me. I'm so thankful for church members who pray for their pastors and their, their spouses and, and for their leaders because your prayers make a difference. And any pastor out here, I can't encourage you enough to go home and pray for God to give you prayer partners. Uh, in one place, that the pastor, after we were there, he asked for it. And, and the church members, what they did is they got them to get in twos and, and each take a day of the week that they would pray for the pastor and his family. And, the, you know, they'd pray together on the phone or in person together. And they, they would text or email the pastor ahead of time saying, how can we pray for you? We're meeting tomorrow. And the pastor would tell them how, and they would pray. And it was life-changing for the pastor and his family, but for the church and for those people who are praying. And, but Zach got into a, a relationship with a girl um, we sent him, we thought it would help him, sent him to work at summer camp. And within uh, two weeks of working there, he calls and says, I got a few days off, can I come home, can I bring a friend? I said, sure. We thought he'd bring a guy, he brings home a girl. And, and this girl was, you know, a nice girl, but I knew she wouldn't be good for him. He, as a mother, you, you sense, you can tell. And I knew she would end up cheating on him and probably leaving him with the kids and, and whatever. And, but you can't, I don't know about you, but I found I can't tell my sons the right girl. I, that's another whole story with my other son. Um, but anyway, so what I did in desperation is start writing in my prayer journal because they were getting serious with each other. And I thought, oh, Lord. And I started writing my journal. This is the kind of wife Zach needed. Now, I had done this with my older boy. And I saw a miracle happen there. And so I thought, this isn't going to work a second time because you can't make God do the same thing. You know, you can't put him in a box. God's let me know, I'll be God. And you, you're, the, you're not. But I got desperate. So I started writing in my journal again. This is the kind of wife Zach needs. And, and I would write in great detail what I thought he needed from a wife that would be passionate about winning souls for the kingdom, a wife that would be faithful and, and cherish and love Zach, one that would deeply love the Lord first, you know, that, and I also wrote that would be a hiker, not a mall shopper, because I like to hike, I don't like to shop, and just, you know, that won't raise my grandkids on TV and, and junk food, but, but healthy food and just whatever. I wrote it down. And but he kept on with this girl, and he was planning to marry this girl. And I, we knew it was bad, and, and, and just the evidence of things I found, you know, in his room, whatever, I knew he wasn't living right, just so many bad things. And Jerry's praying. I'd see Jerry on his face early in the mornings, you know, praying for the conference, praying for his kids, claiming promises. And one of the things Jerry and I like to do is, is, is walk, you know, we need it to be, try to be healthy, and, uh, but I just love the outdoors. And so we go out and walk, and while we're walking, we pray together. Um, and don't worry, we don't pray with our eyes shut, because I've already broken too many bones. And, but we go back and forth, just short sentence prayers, praising thanks, and, and then go into requests. We've seen so many answers doing that together as we walk. And or else driving in the car, we will pray back and forth. We, we started doing that with, with our sons years ago. And they still love to do it now that they're grown men. But that, as we, we'd pray, we'd pray, you know, for God to break him up with this girl, to, for God to convert Zach, and on and on. Well, years were going by here. And I thought, God, when are you going to do something? You know, we're praying, we're claiming promises. My prayer partners pray for it, Zach. We want to see him converted. Well, I, I was uh, doing women's ministries, prayer ministries in our conference, and I started doing youth prayer conferences. And I put a lot of time into that, and then teen girl retreats. But my son, and we prayer walked the camp meeting grounds for God, people to be converted, marriages healed, and we'd see so many miracles at camp meeting. But my son, where was my son? 
My son wasn't in any of the meetings at camp meeting. No, my son would be off in the place where you could have a booth and he was making money, selling something. And it, the youth prayer conferences, my son never came to any of them. I'd say, God, where is my son? Why don't you get him to come? But at one of these prayer conferences, a young girl took an interest in me because, you know, I was coordinating it and she wanted to be involved. And, but I would have old people like me in the back. You know, we didn't lead out. I didn't lead out. I had young people leading out. But in the back, I'd have them there to pray. And we'd sit there in the back praying. And these kids that Bible teachers, pastors, people had dragged to this meeting. And they'd come walking in there, you know, hair's all many ways, orange, red, green. And they'd come walking in and they'd go, what are you here for? I thought this was for youth. And we'd go, we're here to pray for you. Pray for me? Huh. And they'd go on in and sit down. And I'd tell the prayer group, Pray for God to, lead, to tell you which one to really focus on and pray during these four days or three days, whatever it was. And so they would, and, and we would focus in and pray for those kids. I, I had the one with the big mohawk, and another one had the one that was always with the red hoodie. And, and while these kids are out doing outreach, we would be, or in their seminars, we would be walking over the places where they slept in the gym, over every sleeping bag, we'd pray for the body that slept in that bag to be so drenched with the Holy Spirit and God's love before they left. Do you know, by Saturday night, we'd see these young people coming down the aisle, giving their hearts to Jesus Christ, going back to their public schools to lead out in Bible study small groups. It was incredible what would happen. I can't, I don't know if you do that here, but I can't encourage you enough, when your youth meet, Sit in the back and pray for them. Don't criticize their music or the way they dress or anything. Just pray for them. Pray. And out of that prayer, God may lead you to do other things for them. And, but this girl took an interest in me, and, and she called me up, and she said, could we pray together on the phone? And so I started praying with her. You know, I didn't have time for this, but a young person asked for prayer. you got to do it. And so she lived at three and a half hours away, but we would call and, and I basically was praying about her needs because she was involved in ministry. And, but after, when we get done praying, I would always pray for her and I always did this with young people. I would pray, Lord, in your timing when it's right, bring the right young man into her life for her to marry. Someone that that loves you first, God, that is passionate about ministry. They can do ministry together. And then in my heart, privately, I would pray, Lord, could it be my son? Because this was a godly young girl. And so every time I'd pray, I'd say, Lord, could it be my son? But then finally I realized my son is not worthy of such a Holy Spirit-filled girl. She wouldn't want him. And I, I, so I um, told her, Do I need to quit soon? Is that what you're talking about there? Oh, okay. I just need to know what I need to do here. That's okay. So, okay, where was I? Oh, the girl. So I started praying, Lord, make my son worthy of such a Holy Spirit-filled girl. And so this went on for some time. And one time after we prayed probably a year, year and a half or so, or two years together, she stops me as we started to pray. She said, you're always praying for me. How can I pray for you? Well, I thought, you know, I don't want to burden her with the hundreds of conference prayer requests I had. So I said, Lord, what should I ask her to pray for? And immediately it came, have her pray for Zach. And I thought, ooh, I don't want to tell her how bad he is. And so I said to her, I said, you know, Zach's not where we'd like to see him spiritually right now. Would you pray for him to be on fire for God? And he's in a relationship with a girl that he's planning to marry, and we don't think it's good. Would you pray God would break him up if if it's his will. She said she would. Well, I thought she would do it when we prayed together once a week. But unbeknownst to me, this girl started praying 24-7 for him. She did not, you know, know my son. And so she's praying for him. We're all praying for him. And I'm crying out to God one morning in my worship. I said, God, why don't you break him up with this girl? You know it's not good. It's bad. She's dragging him down. She's not good. And you know what God says to me? I want you to start thanking me for five things about her every day. And I'm going, what? There's nothing to thank you for about her. 
I said, give me a hint. What do I pray? And what came to me was number one, she grew up in an alcoholic home. Because of that, she hated alcohol and drugs. And she got my son to quit drinking alcohol and doing drugs. So I wrote it down. Number two, she kept my son from going in the Iraq war. My son is a hero. I mean, he, he wants to defend his country. I mean, one time he's eating in a Denny's with his friends at midnight. Somebody comes in and robs it. He runs after the robber. It's a miracle he didn't get shot. So he's just that kind of kid. If he had gone into the war, he'd have been shot right away. He's six six. You know, he's easy to hit. But she kept him from going. He did not join when he turned 18 because of her. The other thing was a motorcycle. When he turned 18, he was going to buy, he'd been saving up his money, he was going to buy the fastest motorcycle they made. This kid did everything, uh, you know, extreme, extreme sports, everything. The first time he had his license to drive his car, he drove it down a mountain so fast it melted the brakes. Uh, you know, ruined the brakes on it, melted the hubcaps. And they were plastic, but melted them. So it's just that kind of kid. And she kept him from doing those three things. So I never, I don't think I came up with two more. But so I started thanking and praising God for this. So I resigned myself to the fact, I thought, you know, must be God's wanting him to marry her. He, that he's going to have to learn the hard way about women, about life. And so I resigned myself to the fact they're going to have to get married. And so soon after that, Jerry and I are out walking. And Jerry immediately starts in after he, he's been praising and thanking God for a little bit. He goes, God, break him up. You must break him up. You know this isn't good, God. And I'm going, Jerry, you don't know for sure this is God's will. Maybe he needs to marry her. No, it's God's will to break him up. And so we're going back and forth like this. Well, camp meeting came around and Zach was there, but he wasn't in any meetings. He's in the cabin doing things that weren't good or, or else um, reading books on how to get rich or in the, small, the, the place where you can have a booth making money. And I'm going, God, why don't you have my son in the meetings? Well, Zach went home early because he was to go to his girlfriend's for um, her birthday. And so we came home later because we had to take down camp meeting. We get home and Zach's still there. And I said to Zach, why are you home? And he said, and with tears in his eyes, he said, she told me not to come. I said, why? He said, she told me she needs time to think. She needs space. And he said, mom, what does that mean? He's crying now. What does that mean? I said, that, that means she's involved with someone else. He said, no, no, she told me she's not involved with anyone else. I said, trust me, she's involved with somebody else. A whole week goes by, there's no contact. She doesn't call him nothing. I would see my son for the first time in a long time on his knees in the bedroom, his bedroom, praying. At the end of the week, he said, Mom, I don't know what to do, I'm going crazy. She doesn't contact me. I don't know how to go on with my life or what. I said, well, call her up, ask her. That was late at night, I went to bed. About three or so in the morning, I hear my son up in the bathroom coming out, and I thought he's sick to be up that time of night. I go rushing out, and I said, are you all right, Zach? He said, yes, Mom, I'm, I'm okay. And, and he gets back. I found out years later he was actually throwing up. But I, I was tucking him back into bed, and he said, Mom, I called her. And I said, what'd she say? She said, it's over. She was involved having an affair with a teacher at the school. And and he, she told me to go on with my life. I said, oh, Zach, I'm so sorry. He said, it's okay, Mom, it's okay. He said, I just want to go to sleep. We can talk in the morning. I said, okay, Zach. And I covered him up, and I just casually walked out of the room and quietly shut the door. And then I went racing into our room where Jerry was sound asleep, and I started jumping up and down on the bed going, it's over, it's over, it's over. <laughs> and of course, that woke Jerry up. And, but I want to tell you, for the next hour at least, if not longer, we just were praising and praising and worshiping God, thanking Him that He'd broken them up. And come to find out, I didn't know this, 
I had been praying, my family had been praying that Zach would somehow start reading the book of Proverbs. If you've got little children, start now getting them to read Proverbs. Memorize it. I wish I'd have done that, you know, when mine were young. But somehow God got Zach to start reading Proverbs, and Zach realized that it was the wrong girl, that it wasn't good. But he loved her, and he told God, he said, God, I can't hurt her. If you want to break us up, you do it, God, because I don't want to hurt her. And God answered that prayer and broke him up. So, you know, the next day or so, Zach's he's spending a lot of time reading his Bible and praying. And he, he, I, he said to me, I don't want to go back to that college I was at. There's nothing Adventist about it. The only reason he went there was because of that girl. I didn't want him to go there. I always said over my dead body, will my child go to that college? But when your kid turns 18, if you want to keep a relationship with them, you let them do what they choose to do. And, and so, but now he didn't want to go there anymore. It was just hallelujah. I won't say what school it is, but it's in Southern California. But I'm not saying the name of it. So, but anyway, so Zach said he didn't want to go back there. And I said, well, what do you want to do? And he says, I need to do something spiritual. And I said, well, go be a student missionary for a year. And he says, no, no, I don't want to be alone. I, I, I need to be with Christian friends, young people. He said, do you think they'd let me join the youth evangelism team? Because so much evangelism money had come in, we had a couple of youth evangelism teams. And I said, well, I think they've already got everybody because they're just starting within a week or so here. And they've already got their people, but who knows? Call them, call them up and ask this head guy. And I said, you need his number. And I gave him the number. And then I just casually walked out of the room, and I raced and grabbed my cell phone, and I immediately called the, the supervisor, not a supervisor, administrator for this youth evangelism team, one of them. And it happened to be this girl that I prayed with for years. She knew about Zach. She knew what he'd been going through here with the breakup. And I said, guess what, Leah? Zach wants to join the youth evangelism team. And he says, you don't have to pay him. Can he just join and volunteer? And she goes, well, I don't know, maybe. And I'm going, this is a girl who knows how important this is. She says she's been praying for my son. And she says, well, I don't know. And I'm, I, I said, okay, thank you very much. And I hung up. And I thought, Ugh. I said, how can she do that? What I didn't know was she had slid off on the floor because she was sitting in a chair at, our, at the desk and going, God, what are you doing to me? Because you see, she'd been praying and praying for my son. God started giving her a desire for my son. And she was telling God, I don't want to do anything outside your plan for me, God. Take away this desire. And then she finds out Zach wants to join her team. And so they ended up accepting Zach. I didn't find out until just recently that, Z that Leah really pushed on the pastor who was the head of it to get him to accept Zach. So anyway, he accepts Zach. Zach goes off with them for two weeks, and Zach calls me while he's gone. And he, they're working with young people up in Northern California. Zach calls me and he says, Mom, Mom, this is life. I said, what do you mean? He says, Mom, this is life. What do you mean? He said, Mom, I have tried everything to be happy. I said, yeah, I know. Don't tell me about it. And, and he says, Mom, I've tried all extreme sports, and I've tried, never mind, I don't want to hear. And he said, Mom, I am finally happy. He says, I have so much joy in helping young people know Jesus Christ. He says, Mom, I've never had such joy. You know, the one thing I, re one of the many things I regret is that we did not get our sons more involved in reaching out and loving and doing service with others. We took them on a few mission trips and we just really patted ourselves on the back that we'd done a great thing, but we should have done way more, way more, because it's those mission trips, it's the getting them involved in service that puts a passion, a desire in our kids to want to love God and to realize God loves them. And so Zach comes home, uh, they had a few days, a weekend off before they started out again. And Zach says to me, he said, uh, Mom, Monday, when we get back together again, is Leah's birthday. I want to do a surprise birthday party for her. I said, oh, really? Um, you need money? You need help? He says, no, I've got money. 
He said, what I need you to do is call Leah, distract her so I can call her sister and plan the surprise party. I said, I can do it. So I go outdoors and I, I call Leah and talk to her. And Leah said, you know, Janet, Zach did a really good job with the young people it, it, where we were at. I said, oh, oh, good, good, good. We finally hung up when I thought enough time had gone by. And I come in the house, Zach's coming out of his bedroom, coming down the hall to the family room area. And as he walk, walking, I said, Zach, you, did you get it planned? He said, yes, thanks for calling Leah and distracting her. And I said, you're welcome. I said, uh, you know what Leah said? He said, what? She said, you did a really good job with those young people there. And Zach comes around to the couch to sit down. Now, Zach is big. Zach always just poof, into the chair. You know, you have to replace your furniture every year. Just, but this time, he just goes down slowly, all six, six feet, goes down slowly, looking out the window, and he goes, if only I would be worthy of such a Holy Spirit-filled woman. It's the exact words I'd prayed for this boy for several years. I'm telling you, it is so much fun when, when God puts on your heart how to pray and you keep praying those words, you will hear them coming out of people's mouths. God is amazing. So Zach um, and Leah, to make the story short, have been married now for 13 years? They just had an anniversary, 12 years. 12 years they've been married and Zach counts the days, he used to count the seconds, then the minutes, and now the days they've been married. I was there a while ago, and he came, he left and came back, and he had a bouquet of beautiful flowers. And I thought, what's the occasion? It's not a birthday, it's not an anniversary, maybe it's for me. <laughs> but it was for the number of days they had been together, which was, I don't know, I don't remember how many thousands it was, but anyway. But Zach is so in love with Leah. He, he will make her a special breakfast and wait for her to wake up. She likes to sleep in a little, and he gets up early. And he will just wait, wait by the door, waiting for her to wake up so he can give her this breakfast. Oh, but, you know, it, she's everything I journaled and more. And my other daughter-in-law is the same thing. You know, I was sitting um, a while before this, a couple years before this, I was sitting at Leah's graduation. I just went there to be nice because she'd helped me out so much with youth prayer conferences, teen girls retreats. So I go to support her, and as I'm watching her walk down the aisle of the church, she's not in a graduation dress. Uh, they didn't wear the graduation gown until Sunday. So they're in church clothes, so she's going down the aisle. I'm sitting there watching her, and I suddenly felt like I was watching a bride go down the aisle with flowers. And I looked at her, and I rubbed my head, and I thought, I've been working too hard. I'm not getting enough sleep. I looked at her again, and it was like this bride going down the aisle. And I thought, oh, I've been working too much. And then I thought, God, are you trying to tell me something? And just that faint thought, she's going to marry Zach. And I thought, no way. No way could that happen. Zach's involved with a girl he's planning to marry. It's going on three years. And, and she's a Holy Spirit-filled girl. My son is not Holy Spirit-filled. There's no way. I never told anybody about that. But they, God brought them together. God got them to marry. My son is a pastor now. And my son, when he became a pastor, uh, or when he and Leah, I don't know if they'd married yet or were engaged, he had some behaviors that made me cringe. I was afraid he'd run Leah off. And I started praying about it. And and what broke my heart was, is I realized the way Zach was treating her was what he'd learned from his parents in watching us. I said, oh God, forgive us. Forgive us for the bad example we've been to this boy. And God gave on me the verse, Joel 2.25. Do you know that verse? Joel 2.25 is one of the most powerful verses to me in the Bible. But it's, I will heal, I will restore uh, the years the locusts have eaten the consuming locust, the crawling locust. Locust is the sin. And this is a verse, if you've been abused and had a terrible life, this is a verse that God will heal and restore the years that sin has eaten in your life. You've made mistakes with your kids like I have. God will heal those years. I started claiming that, putting my finger on it. And we, in this handout we've got for you, there's a, 
a section promises on for children, but a quote from Ellen White where she talks about the mother of Augustine. She would put her finger on the Bible text, presenting before God his own words, and pleaded only as a mother can. And she saw him converted. This was a great reformer, Augustine, many years ago. But put your finger on that promise and claim it. And do you know what happened with Zach? While he was off at the seminary, Zach had a major, major conversion experience. He's not the same young guy, and he now calls Jerry and I to live a higher level in God. Zach is so in love with Jesus. Incredible. And Nestor knows that, and, and they get together and pray once a week, I think, on the phone with some other guys. But you, I don't know if you've made mistakes and you regret that, whatever. Your God can heal, restore, and change what's happened with your kids in your life. And, you know, I have a similar story with my other son. The one, one thing, I never thought, I'd always been taught, a daughter is a daughter all of her life, a son is a son till he takes a wife. So I had braced myself that when my son's married, that would be it. You know, I'd probably never see them again or much, but I would enjoy them up until the time they married. But my daughter-in-laws love me. I don't know, I don't deserve it, but they love me. I never journaled that. I never wrote that. That's one of those surprises from God. And that's the thing about praying. That's the thing about journaling. When I say journaling, for me, and everybody does it different, but for me, it's I write down that prayer request in, in capital letters. I'll even underline it and put the date by it, like, uh, Lord, uh, break Zach up with this girl or, or help Tyson to make an A in math or whatever it is and put the date by it. And then whenever it's answered, come back and just briefly write in red the answer, maybe highlighted in yellow. Do you know what that does for you? That becomes your life book. It becomes your testimony because you start seeing answers after answers that God does. In fact, you know what you'll start seeing? You'll start seeing God do blessings and surprises that you haven't even prayed about, that you've only wished on your heart. You know, we, we didn't have time for it, but we decided, we didn't get into after midnight Thursday night here, but Friday, uh, Jerry said, let's squeeze it in and, and take some people out to eat. These were people who years ago, when Tyson was a little boy here in Colorado, we wanted him to experience winning people to Jesus. So we started praying for a Bible study. That was Sunday night. Monday morning, this woman calls Jerry at the office and said, could you study with my cousin? He really wants Bible studies. Well, uh, we ended up doing that. Jerry ended up baptizing him and his girlfriend, and then they, Jerry married them. Anyway, so we got to eat with them yesterday. It took years, though, before they really got involved in the church. Because you know how a lot of churches are? They don't have anything to do with the new people. You know, they've got their own little cliques and their friends. And it was hard to get them in involved in a church because, you know, we were always traveling. But finally, there was a church in this Denver area that reached out to them and drew them in. But as we were sitting eating with them, this guy, Sal, he says, you know, I'm beginning to understand that relationship with God. And he said, I've got, I think, like eight grandchildren. But he said, it's only been since I re when I retired that I, the last two that I've been able to, I, I babysit, taken care of them. And he says, I've gotten so close to them. He says, now I understand why I need to spend time with God. Because he said, I definitely favor these two grandchildren because I know them. And they know me, and we love each other. And, it, and I thought, that is a tremendous example of why we need to spend time with God. Because it's those who spend time with God that God knows, and they know God. And God is just tripping all over himself to work in your behalf, to bless your life in, in ways that you don't even know you need, at least that I don't know. But he's amazing. So we, we have uh, until 5 o'clock, I understand. And we'd like to spend this last 30 minutes just in prayer to pray uh, for whatever is on your heart or to pray for your community, uh, pray for the Holy Spirit, however God would lead. And I'm going to let Jerry lead out in this.
Yeah, we just want to pray together. And um, probably won't be a half an hour. Time's gotten away from us a little bit. But um, we do want to pray especially about um, some things that are coming up. Do you want to share that first so that they can pray about that a little? Or should we go ahead? What do you think? Uh, because we want to, you've you got some major outreach coming. And we, we want to be praying specifically. Janet was going to share a little more. We've seen such amazing things happen when people cover evangelistic outreaches with much prayer. And we could go on another week here telling you stories of that. So we don't want to miss the chance to pray with you over those things. And uh, okay. Thank you. We have wanted to, as pastors, take a moment to pray for our northern Colorado area. You know in March, uh, partnered with the Voice of Prophecy, we're going to churches from Greeley to Brighton here in Loveland and Longmont. We're, we're going to, to do a collective effort in reaching every home in northern Colorado with an invitation. And so we want to pray for that uh, this afternoon. We want to pray together for that. And we're going to we're going to close with that. So we're going to pause for just a minute, and I want to share some things with you that Jerry and Jen, you should have seen their suitcases, the, just uh, packed full of material that we're going, to, we're going to share. And then we're going to circle up in praying for the evangelistic initiative in northern Colorado. So if a couple of you guys here on the end will just jump up and follow my lead here. Uh, my friend, Melody Mason, wrote a book, probably the, one of the most recent, the most recent best book on prayer that I've seen in the Adventist church, written by a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, and it's Daring to Ask for More. Changed impact in my life. And they brought some out. Um, limited resource. Uh, they packed their suitcases. So here's what we have. We have the pocket edition. And if every couple or family would at least get one of these, the pocket edition, all right? For the pastors that are here, uh, they were able to bring eight of the full edition. And uh, if the pocket in edition inspires you, then uh, it wouldn't be a, it's a, it's a one-click purchase, right, on, on Amazon to get the, the other. But uh, so gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, pastors and everyone, every or every family unit, daring to ask for more. One of the most delightful works there. Uh, if you, we might be uh, moving faster than they are. Uh, Michael and Paul, if you guys will run with the blue, you guys run with the blue magazine. The, Mark Finley put together a work on prayer as well, and it's, it's really well, uh, well done. We're going to share one with everyone. There's a, even a few extra on the table in the back, but we want everyone to get one of these. In light of the, the intercessory prayer that we're doing for March, the, the evangelistic effort, this would be worth reading and sharing. Uh, so make sure you, you have that as well. That's right. We're going to... You're going to have stuff coming from all different angles, all right? There is another book, uh, As the Light Lingers, Basking in the Word of God, that mentors and directs you in, in taking hold of the promises of God and holding them as part of your prayer journey. And so that's one for every family as well, or couple, or individual, uh, that that is a, yeah go. this book is is really amazing nina atchison wrote curriculum for north america recently but she's a deeply spiritual lady on our revival and reformation committee she and her husband you know you should get into the word we can tell you get into the word janet can say the word's powerful get into it but how this family found all kinds of methods that help their kids and them really want to be in the bible and enjoy hearing god's voice out of it She's a teacher, she's got practical bookmarks, she's got practical steps in there. So uh, that, that book is really worth the read. Excellent. I just, I wonder, is there anyone that has not seen or had this book in their hands and taken it home? Is there anyone that you have not had this, you don't have this book? Oh, it's the steps to, 
Well, it's right here. <laughs> Steps to personal revival. Jed, there are, is in the, in the suitcase there, uh, this book, Steps to Personal Revival, in the suitcase. Steps to Personal Revival. They should be sitting, uh, standing up. There you go. Uh, get out as many of these as is needed. And then if you, if you do not get one, especially if you're a Campion, if you're here at Campion, I've got a stack of them in my office I'd be happy to share with you. This book is one that Jerry referred to earlier as, as uh, one that has impacted the world in praying for the Holy Spirit. And so uh, they just brought a few. I have a, a stack in my office as well. Um, Nestor, on my bookshelf, bottom of my bookshelf, is more of the steps to personal revival. And so we'll get more of those. And then uh, just some stories on prayer. Of these? Yeah. Um, Ken, there's story catcher in there. I think we might have enough for, I don't mean to be selective, I really don't, but there was limited resources. Raise your hand if you have not gotten the steps to personal revival, Pastor Nestor will be on that. Uh, and then if, we may still run out even with the extras. Uh, if you are a pastor or an elder, the story catcher would be for pastors and elders. Deanne, pastors and elders. Nestor, you got some over here? Yeah, I had a... Bless you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, as far as if you're part of Campion here, we'll be happy to order more. They're, they're, um, they're not that expensive of a resource, but they are a powerful resource. But if you're a pastor or an elder, I for sure want you to get your hands on the story catcher and uh, to have that. There is, Deanne had shared with you that on the back table for the conference, there's some, there's some, resources. But Jerry and Janet have also brought stacks of their own notes, their packages of notes, and their presentations along with other materials. So there's two tables back there. And we wish and pray that you would just avail yourself at the end of our prayer time to collect and to share as much of that. They're not going to fly home with it. And we want it to be useful for our, our prayer journey here as we prepare for 2020. So Deanne is our point person, yeah. Jerry and Janet, well, Jerry, uh, oh, there. <laughs> we want to, to spend just a few minutes in praying for our 2020 evangelistic initiative. Uh, and so what I'm wondering here is if, if we could do some groups, whether it's four or six or eight of whoever is in your, just collect around. And then I'm gonna ask that Jerry and Janet just keep an eye on it and lead us in a time of prayer as they see. So spend uh, three, three or four minutes with a group around you. And then Jerry and Janet, if you would just take the mic and close us with a pr time of prayer with that. And now we're just gonna blessing upon you. You can sit or kneel, whatever you're comfortable, and that'll be the end. Dear Lord, I thank you for the privilege we have of, of knowing this message and knowing you, Jesus. Um, we're so privileged as Jan and I travel around the world and see countries that are 95% Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim or so secular like Japan and other places. We just, our heart goes out. Uh, we're so thankful that we know about you, Jesus, but Still 1.8 billion people in the world have never heard your name. And we know, Lord, unless we, unless we meet the call of Joel, unless we intensely pray, confess our sins, and, and answer that call instead of just talking about it, 
that it, it will be a while yet. But we know you're coming. And we know too, with one or two big miracles, the whole world will be talking about what happens this week. Uh, it's not a matter of getting over every hill anymore. It's a matter of you raising somebody from the dead or working some major miracle that points the light on this message. And the, the media and the social media will have it everywhere this week. So it's us, Lord. Help us to um, search our hearts and let you search our hearts. What is it that you need from your remnant? Why are you still waiting a little longer when you said you wanted to come back in the 1800s? It's not you. It's not the world. It's somehow your patience with, with your people. So help us to understand and to move forward. Thank you for this church. Thank you for its leadership that wanted to have this uh, prayer weekend. Bless them. Raise up laborers, Lord, for the ministry, for going out and getting our neighbors for these meetings, for prayer, for every ministry that's needed, for our children, for the school here. Uh, we ask for your anointing and your blessing voice of prophecy, and for the other churches that have come in and that are in this area working. Lord, may Northern Colorado become a great light. The revival of, of the latter rain, Revelation 18.1, will even begin here and spread to the rest of the world. That's our prayer. That's the reason we're on our knees this afternoon. But anoint and bless these people. Thank you that they've come out. Thank you for the walk you have with them already and the, the many of them that are praying so much already. Just increase us, Lord. Help us all to be serious about it, not just talk about it, to uh, pull away from some of the activities that waste our time during a week and maybe things that seem good but are still getting in the way of the most imp important things. Help us love you, Lord, with all our hearts and minds and soul and our neighbors as ourselves. Father, you know the whole reason we're here meeting is because of you, because of Jesus. And Lord, for each one of us here, we pray you'll just keep us obsessed with praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And uh, you know, Ellen White tells us that you want to give us more, but we're not ready to receive it. God, help us as your people to be prepared, to be ready so that you can pour out all that you want to of the Holy Spirit power in our lives, to reach and love people to you. God, we need you to fill us with the love of Jesus. Thank you for doing that for each one here and blessing each one in the ways they need. We thank you, Lord. Let's just close singing, He's Able. He's able, He's able, I know He's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He's able. sets the captives free. He makes the lame to walk again, and he causes the blind to see. He's able, he's able, I know he's able. I know my Lord is able. We pray these things abiding in you, in the wonderful, powerful name of Jesus and because of his blood, claiming your promise that when we abide in you, we can ask anything in your name. You will do it. You'll give us fruit to the glory of the Father and to a fullness of joy in each of us. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.